Hello, MSATers. I'm so excited to be doing uh, part one of a two-part series, one um, on resume, and then the second part of this will be on, on cover letter. Both of them kind of uh, usually go together um, in the application process when you start applying to jobs. Um, so exciting conversations that we're getting ready to have in this interdisciplinary course, right? And I get the privilege of really um, talking about this key concept in the field of athletic training known as transition to practice and trying to get you prepared for what it means to transition from being in a graduate program to actually um, getting ready to apply to jobs and then begin to practice as an athletic trainer, right? Many of you have, have been students for five straight years. Some of you have taken a year or two off from school and have decided to come back. But regardless of where you are in that walk, essentially one thing is consistent across all of you in the program, which is you're getting ready to transition to practice all over again. So the first key component to um, getting you prepared to apply to positions and getting you prepared to interview is the resume. So when we know about um, resumes, when we look at this kind of job success pyramid, right? So this right here, um, we can look at the top of the pyramid as being the most successful component, which is you actually getting your job, your job in athletic training. Maybe even for those of you that want to apply to graduate school and maybe go to PT school or medical school or PA school or any other school outside of athletic training, um, then it would be you getting into the graduate school of your choice. But for most of you, I think the transition to practice is actually practicing as a certified athletic trainer. So at the top of this pyramid is you landing the job, but we have to start somewhere, right? How do you get to this yellow point in the pyramid? Well, first it starts with writing a resume that will get you hired. And then I would add to this pyramid, if I could, writing a cover letter as well. And then teaching you job search strategies, uh, which you'll get in your seminar class, preparing you for any type of job fair. But if we skip this component, then getting you ready to interview with, with professionals or with um, individuals in human resources who will be doing hiring. Our job as a program is to walk you through each of these steps and to make sure that you're prepared so that when you get to the interview, you're actually prepared enough to actually land the job. So we start with resume and we start with it relatively early on in the program. We don't start it in the first year of the program because um, by then you don't have enough experience to actually build out a resume, but following the first year, you have at least two semesters of clinical experience, you have some clinical hours, and so now we can start to build at least the template um, or the foundation for the resume. And then when you go into that second year of the program, it just becomes an easy transition to continue to add to the resume that you've built out. So our job today in this lecture is really focusing in on how do we get you to write what we call is a winning resume, one that stands out above the 50 to 100 um, applicants that are applying to the same jobs um, or internships or fellowships or graduate schools that you're actually applying to. So what is the purpose of a resume? I, I always assume that you all know what the purpose is, but I've identified really three key purposes and those are identified in the red. Number one, it identifies what you have to offer to the um, job that you are applying to, right? So if I'm, if I'm an interviewer or if I'm a hiring manager, one of the things that I wanna know is what is it that you have to bring to our clinical team, right? Or our graduate program that other students in the pile don't. What makes you kind of unique? what makes you very distinct, right? So as you're writing your resume, you want to be using key buzzwords that would be different from the other peers in the program, right? The other thing that we love about resumes is they can either be sent digitally or handed, given out as a hard copy um, to references, to people that you meet, to people that you should happen to intern with, right? But the main purpose of, of a resume um, is to get you an interview. That's the main purpose. It lays out all of your clinical skills. It lays out your education. It lays out the hours of uh, internships. Um, and so it really is kind of the hiring managers, for lack of better words, it's the book for the hiring manager to learn about you, right? And this is the first step most often um, as a hiring manager myself, looking at the resumes and weeding through these, 
and determining who my top three candidates are going to be usually comes from the resume itself. So the resume is by far one of the most important components that we need to build out over the next year and a half that you're in the program. So there are two different types of resume formats that we'll talk about. Um, I talk about them because I think they are both important to understand, but recognizing that most of you will use what we call is a chronological format. So that's why I'm going to start with that format first. The chronological format um, is by far the most common type of resume format that you will um, see, whether you're a part of a hiring committee or whether or not you're actually the one applying to a job. It's the one that most hiring managers are most used to seeing. Um, and we really love them because they're easy to read. They're easy to, to follow uh, because they follow a distinct order. So if you are looking on this right hand side of the slide, the first thing that a chronological resume always starts with is the, the candidate's name and their contact information, and then maybe a little bit of an objective. So a one or two sentence objective about why you're applying to the job or what you're looking for as you're applying. The next thing in order is, is your education. And this is why most entry-level graduates start with a chronological format is because the education is um, at the forefront of your resume. And this is extremely important because the reality is you probably have gaps in your work history because you spent the last year and a half or two in a master's of science and athletic training program. Therefore, you may not have as much work experience, certainly internship experience, but you may not have worked in the field. And so placing that education higher on the resume allows the employer to know oh, they just finished their master's. And so that's why we don't see them working as a professional. Um, and that's why there might may be gaps in the actual work history of a resume. So it's extremely important to understand the chronological format really sets you up for success because it's going to present that educational experience first, and then it's going to um, present the uh, internship experience second, right? And each of these things that we list within the education, within the work experience, within the internship experience, all of those are gonna be in reverse chronological order. So in other words, with the most recent thing happening first, and then the next recent thing second, so forth and so on. So an example in education would be, all of you will have your master's of science and athletic training listed first your bachelor's degree would go second and any other degree thereafter would go third fourth etc similarly with internship experience you're going to start with the most recent internship experience first and then list previous internship experiences thereafter so this is the chronological format again um, it's it's reverse chronological order it, it the, you start with the name and objective education and then experience goes next the opposite type of resume format is a functional format. And I think it's important to put this type of resume in there because what it does is it focuses in on skills and abilities that you have, um, but it groups it by function versus by the actual job itself. So an example here, you'll see experience highlights and you'll say, oh, I was, I provided administrative support. And you might list the jobs that you did that in and how you did that in those jobs, but it isn't jobs specific. It's more functional specific or more skill specific. And since you guys aren't certified yet and haven't really developed a true skill set, then a functional format resume isn't the best resume for an entry level transition to practice type of professional. Again, another thing that we see that's very different with a functional resume um, when we compare it to a chronological resume is you start with this kind of qualification summary, right? So you're capable of answering telephones, you um, have great uh, Microsoft Word, Excel, et cetera. So we're summarizing the uh, skill set that we have. And so again, it doesn't tell the employer, you see education way down here, right? That you just finished a program. It doesn't highlight the internship experience, right? Um, in fact, it focuses in on the skills. And since you're all relatively new to a profession, the last thing we wanna do is highlight the lack of skills that you may have or the lack of experience that you may have because you've been enrolled in a professional program. So functional format resumes do have a role and will have a role. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. So 
chronologically, um, we use, you want to use a chronological resume um, when you have a structured work history, which you all do in a, cl a clear career path. So example, many of you will transition into athletic training. That's a, a clear career path. When you are applying to an entry level position, which means you've just graduated and this will be your first job in the field, or if you are a recent graduate. On the opposite end of that, uh, a functional resume can be used if you've been unemployed for a few years, but then you're going back into that particular industry or if you're switching industries altogether. So I'll give an example of maybe there's a student in our program who um, decided later on in life in the program that, OK, AT, I love it, but I think I want to go to PT school or I think I want to work as, I don't know, a mental health coach, for example, then you may want to switch over to the functional resume, which would then allow you to focus in on the skills that would prepare you for a job that's outside of what you've been doing for the last two years. But for the most part, most of us should fall into this chronological resume format. So I want to get into the Nessic necessary categories that resumes should have and the things that I actually look for when I am interviewing a candidate, uh, when I'm interviewing students who want to enter into the program. First and foremost, you have to have an identifying information uh, category. That's usually the first thing that anybody will see on the resume, right? And that at minimum should include your name, your current and local address, or where you want things to be mailed to. It should include a daytime telephone number, which is most often going to be your cell phone. But please, one of the things that I see oftentimes is students forget the area codes, right? So example, you're applying to a job in San Diego and you um, don't put the 619 or the 858. So make sure you're putting the actual area code um, if you uh, do put your cell phone number on there, or any phone number that you put on there, please make sure you change your voice message so it's professional. Um, can't tell you the number of times I've called students and there's loud music playing and, hey, you've reached so-and-so, hit me back. And I'm like, oh, that's way unprofessional. So one of the things you want to do as you transition to practice and you start applying to jobs is to change your voice message. Hello, this is Nicole Cosby, or hello, you've reached the voicemail of Nicole Cosby. Thank you for calling me. I'm unavailable, but I will call you back at my earliest convenience. Something very generic, but yet something very professional. You want to put your email address and then any other accounts that you might have, in particular, your LinkedIn account um, should also be noted in this very upfront category known as the identifying information. So here are a few examples of students who just graduated and had some really good identifying information category. So this is Bailey. Uh, Bailey had a large first name, which is OK to do. It brings it out. It stands out. I'm going to remember Bailey. She's got her address, her cell phone number, and then she's linked them to her what is called portfolio account, which is also linked within her LinkedIn account. The next student is Dana Tate. Uh, Dana Tate, as you can tell, laid hers out a bit different than Bailey, and both are um, great ways to do it. Um, Dana's is going to be more horizontal, as you can tell. If we go back to Bailey, Bailey's going to be more vertical. I personally like the horizontal layout. It takes uh, less of the page and leaves more of the page for you to input more information. So this is Dana. She has her address all on one line. She's got her email, her, her cell phone, and then again, a link to the portfolio account, which links them indirectly to uh, their LinkedIn account. And then this is Abner, again, more vertical in nature. Um, he's got all of the identifying information. He has his phone number, his email address, and then also linked to the portfolio account. So these are all examples of ways that you could use to kind of set up the first part of your resume. My preference is, again, it's going to be more horizontal because as you guys start to build the resume, one of the things you'll learn is resume should only be one page. So the le less amount of space that we can take in the, f the name component, the more space you have as you get ready to build out all of the other information for, for your resumes. Uh, one of the things that I talked about um, is uh, having a career objective. So this is just one or two kind of straightforward sentences that really just describe what you're looking for in, in your job search. I, my name is Nicole Cosby, and I'm interested in securing a Division I um, head athletic trainer 
position with ba men's basketball. That would be very specific. That tells you what I want to do and how I want to do it, right? Um, you want to tailor it to the graduate school or the job you're planning to apply to. So example, if you know that you're applying to a track and field position, then your objective should be tailored to that. My name is Nicole Cosby. I'm uh, really passionate about working with Division One or Division Two track athletes in particular. I really enjoy working with distance runners and creating or developing running plans. That would be an example. The key thing that I look for when I have an, um, an athletic training student or someone applying to a job is whether or not they've done the research on Point Loma. So do they know our mission? Do they know our values? Do they know our program if they're applying to teach in our program? Do they know our athletic training or sports medicine staff? Like what things do they do or do they place in their resume that shows me they're not just applying to this job, but they're specifically have done the work to figure out who we are kind of as an institution. That's extremely important and something that employers look for all the time. So here's a great example to work in an environment where I can strengthen my skills as a healthcare provider, gaining experience working alongside and medical doctor to ultimately reach my goal of attending graduate school, right? If we wanted to change this, we could even say attending PA school or attending medical school, right? If we wanted to be a little bit more specific, but this was the student's objective and it made it very clear to me. They want to improve their skill set that they learned in the athletic training program. They want to learn alongside a medical doctor so that they can get ready to go to either medical school or PA school or even PT school, right? So that's an example of a very short objective, but one that would tell me what this student wants to do ultimately. Okay. In terms of necessary categories, the next category in the resume, so you've got the title, you have the objective, the next category is going to be education. You're always going to list the highest degree first. And so even though you don't have your MS in athletic training quite yet, you're still going to list it, but then you would just list the date that that degree is actually going to be conferred. And I'll show you a few examples. If you have an AA degree from a community college, you can list that, but most often we don't do that unless of course it's relevant to the job. So if you are applying to a community college, for example, then I certainly would put that AA degree on there because it shows that you have an appreciation, right? Uh, and a respect for community college athletes. But you're always gonna go with your MS in athletic training first, your BA or BS next, and then if an AA degree. Do not put your high school diploma on there. If you're in a master's degree program, then we already know that you obviously have a high school diploma. And then most often we encourage students to put their GPA on there if it's a 3.0 or above. If it's below, don't bother. So here are some examples, right? So education and uh, big, bold caps. And then this student put master of science and athletic training, master, masters of athletic training. I probably would have put science in there. Point Loma Nazarene, that's where they got it. And then their expected graduation date, which would be spring 2022. Then they have a bachelor's of arts um, in kinesiology from University of St. Catharines, right? So this is one way, very horizontal. The next student is going to be a little bit more vertical. So they have education in green and not caps. Point Loma Nazarene. San Diego, California, Master of Science in Athletic Training, and when they were going to get that. And then the student also went to Point Loma twice. So we could very well just condense this, right? We could get rid of this part and then just shift it, shift up that Bachelor's of Arts and Exercise in Sports Science and put that June 2021 there to create more space within the resume, right? So can you guys see how I'm editing this as we go? And then last but not least, this student did something a little bit different. This is a student who's applying to PA school when they graduate. And so theirs looks a little bit different. So they have Point Loma Nazarene University. They have their area of study as athletic training. Their GPA was a 4.0. And then they talk about relevant coursework, which is important if you're applying to graduate school because they want to know, do you have some of the prerequisites that you need for the program or what things are going to set you up for success, right, in the actual program? Similarly, then the student went to Pepperdine, what their area of study was, what their GPA was, and then relevant coursework. Again, many of these are bio. Um, prerequisites for the graduate school that they're applying to. So you guys can see there are different ways to lay out the educational, um, what am I thinking, category, um, and it'll be up to you and how you set that up. Just remember, everything you do, you really want to save space on that resume for your internship and your experience and the things that you're going to place there. Okay, so next is experience. This is going to be the largest part of your 
of your resume. In this experience category, you're going to list the job title or the internship. You're going to list the employer or the clinical site, um, the city, state, and the dates of that employment or internship. And then you're going to always list them in reverse chronological order, right? So the most current internship listed first with the um, least current listed last. And you're always going to do uh, what we call is a bulleted approach to the uh, skills um, or the things that you did. You want to be very specific when you're doing that, right? And so I've, I've given you a few examples, one good, one bad. So developed inventory tracking system to ensure medications were consistently stocked and easy to locate. That's very clear to me. They did something. They were responsible for developing this, right? The red one is red because I don't think it's very specific. So promoted to team lead as a result of consistently demonstrating excellent organizational skills. So excellent organizational skills, that could be a whole bunch of things. So what were those excellent organizational skills? You were a good leader. You took initiative. What were they? So not very specific and it doesn't tell me anything about anything. So as you're writing your bullet points underneath your experiences, you want to make sure that you're very specific about the things that you did. And so here are some examples. So this is a student who had their internship at the University of San Diego. Uh, and you can see this is, again, in reverse chronological order, most recent, least recent. Um, and then here's what they said they did. They worked with soccer and baseball teams. They had 500 um, clinical hours. They did the following, advised student athletes regarding their conditioning, mental health, and nutrition, worked with physicians, evaluated, see how that's very specific. Then they were at Synergy Orthopedics where they did surger, surgery and clinical rotations. They did about 50 hours of that, and here's what they did. So you can see in this bulleted point list, they have very specific kind of details about what they did in the internship. The next student had clinical experience at Point Loma Nazarene University. Here's the sports that they worked with and clinical hours. They didn't list them because that was their current clinical site. Um, so here's what we know they did. They were a scribe for physician clinic. They were able to administer antigen and PCR COVID testing, right, which is extremely important now. They performed SCAT5 VOMS. They evaluated, diagnosed, and treated musculoskeletal injuries. So you can see that they're being very specific about the things that they did. This student actually just got an amazing job uh, with the Arizona Diamondbacks. So clearly their resume was um, really pointed out the key kind of skills that they did and they were very specific with their kind of either um, verbs and or adjectives to describe their clinical skill set. Um, okay, so another thing that we need to do is sometimes we're going to add things to the list of experiences in our bullet points that don't necessarily describe um, a skill, but rather a task. Um, so you want to start the that kind of bullet point out with an adverb. So I accurately filed documents, right? Strictly adhere to all of the safety infection prevention standards, tactfully and courteously handled um, difficult customers at busy. So when you're using, um, when you're listing bullet points that don't describe skills, but still describe something you did, you want to be very specific with the type of verb that you're using. I gave you an example down here from a student with the San Diego Loyal who really didn't have, let's say, a lot of hands-on experience, right? They observed, they helped, they learned, they built professional relationships. So you can see how they're kind of using different just. Um, descriptors to help describe some of the things that they did, even though those things didn't really develop their actual clinical skill set. Okay, so when we think about experience, that's going to describe all of the skill set, all of the things that you've learned in that internship or in the program. And most often what they recommend is kind of using that STAR approach. So you describe a situation, you tell what task you did, you tell what, what action um, you took, and then you say what the result of that was, right? So an example of that would be, okay, the situation is I ran culture studies on uh, 85 amoebas, I guess that situation in task. You did that over a daily for two months, um, and then there were three successful research projects as a result, right? Um, so you also want to be able to list in this um, experience what am I thinking? Experience category, um, the number of hours at each clinical site. This is extremely important. Um, I, I, I can't tell you the number of resumes that I've gotten from um, previous AT cohorts, and they don't have their number of clinical hours. The number of clinical hours at a clinical site definitely is important because it tells us that you've had exposure. It tells us that you've had experience. It tells us that you've had hands-on clinical experience as well. 
So I took this kind of blurb from um, an expert who has looked at over, I don't know, I think he said like 10,000 resumes, right? Um, so one of the things that he said that struck me is we want to focus on convincing the human that will eventually read our resume before we work on in injecting keywords. So in other words, when you write a resume, you want to be able to write that resume so that it truly grabs the human that is reading that resume, right? They've never met you. So when you write a resume, if you're using basic words to describe yourself, if you're not using really good adverbs or verbs or action items, then you're just like every other resume in the pile, right, you guys? So you want to be thinking about that as you write these verbs to describe the task that you've done over the last year and a half or two in the program. So once you have all of your bull, your once all of your bullet points are written, the question that you ask yourself is, are they focused on driving value and selling your experience, right? Versus just putting in these buzzwords or keywords, which are fillers and not meaningful at all. And don't tell me anything about who you are or how you developed over the last two years. So one of the things that um, this writer suggested is when you want to find the right keywords for your resume, right, which they may shift depending on the job you have, he recommends using uh, wordclouds.com. Um, and what you're going to do is basically take the job description and paste that job description into wordclouds.com. And uh, once you do that, then WordCloud will produce a ton of words that you can actually use within each of your bullet points to help you um, describe what you did, but then also to relate it back to the job position that you guys are applying for. If you can't tell, I'm getting pretty pumped about this because in the past, we didn't have access to something like this, something so simple that could help us with these keywords that people who are reading your resume um, are looking for, right? He ended his um, his letter by saying, when you write your resume, your goal is to include those words um, at the same frequency as they appear in the job description. So this is like new to me, new to you guys, hopefully something um, that you can kind of pick up on. So example, if the job description says we are looking for uh, a, uh, a skilled or experienced uh athletic trainer to work with our cross country team and develop um, evidence based protocols around medial tibial uh, stress syndrome, then in your buzzword, you're going to write medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, you're going to write distance runners. You're going to talk, you're going to add those buzzwords more and more because then it shows that you're really prepared or at least experienced in that particular job description. So just a thought. Um, and as I Get, learn more about resumes and I add more to this lecture. That's one thing that stood out this year as I began to prepare for this particular lecture. So other necessary categories. Um, and I wanted to say, I wanted to give some examples for AT because a lot of what you'll find when you Google uh, most often are going to be like marketing or business. And so um, you want to add impact to your resume. You want to give a sense of the scope of your skills. So I created these developed a prevention program for the entire football team. That would, that would make me go, whoa, right? Treated division one professional athletes, um, worked in a 10 person office, and I was extremely collaborative, uh, responsible for COVID testing for over 200 athletes. So see how I'm giving like, I'm dropping big things, D1 professional athletes, 200 giving scope, place in charge of injury clinical um, uh, within two weeks of being assigned to my clinical site. So now you're in charge of maybe rehab um, or injury evaluations within two weeks. That tells me that the, the clinical site saw something in you um, and promoted you very quickly. So these are all examples of words that you can use to describe. Certainly there are more as you prepare your resume. Okay, there are also optional categories. So honors, awards, hobbies, and interests. Um, the biggest key thing here is avoiding uh, listing those which may be controversial. Typically, politics are going to be the, the one that's probably the most controversial. Um, but also avoiding like, you know, honors that you graduate with in high school. Certainly at, in your, at the bachelor's level, if you were summa cum laude, magna cum laude, or cum laude, certainly should in, um, add that. I love when students add a hobby or two because it shows me that they actually have a life outside of, of work. So I think that's extremely important. 
you want an extracurricular activities or professional affiliations, um, more so I would say professional affiliations category, which would then list all of the memberships that you will have by the time you graduate from, from Point Loma. So your NATA membership, your BOC, um, if you held any offices, so like president or vice president for a club, um, if you're doing any service, that would go there. And then last but not least would be licenses, certifications, credentials, and or training. So any licenses that you have, so all of your CPR certified, all of your emergency response certified, all of your oxygen certified, some of you might be strength and conditioning certified, et cetera, et cetera. Those are gonna go there. And it can look something like this. So this is an example of one student. They have their American Red Cross CPR and they tell us when it expires, which is extremely important. So they've listed all of their um, certifications. Then we have the next student who did a very similar thing, um, but just changed up the color, right? And put in their professional um, affiliation. So NATA, board certification, when they became members is listed there. Um, so you can see that there are just different ways to kind of go about doing um, or listing these items, but certainly should be there for sure. And then optional categories would be publications, which I don't think any of you have, but if you do, you would list that research article or that publication, any computer skills. So we're not talking like, you know, Excel um, or Microsoft Word. We all assume that you are competent in that, but things that were in the clinical site, maybe like um, clinical documentation or EMRs, that would be an extremely important one. And then last but not least, if you are applying to a military position, and you are in the military or you have a parent that is in the military, then this is a huge. But if you're not, then there typically isn't any reason to put your military service. Okay, so then I come to the hardest part of this lecture, which is really about resume length. Um, traditionally speaking, a resume should never be more than one page, especially for re recent grads. So one page front and back, right? Um, two page with extensive, like, so two pages front and back with extensive and related experience. But ultimately, our, my job is to get you to one page, ideally one page, not front and back. So you're succinct, um, you're to the point, your bullet points all make sense and they don't repeat themselves. And then in terms of layout, um, it will be very tempting for you to go into Word, open it up and type in resume and use a template. They are the hardest thing to work with. They are very difficult to, um, for me to actually provide feedback and to adjust. So please do not use a template. Just start with a blank Word document and build your own template. It'll be easier to work with and trust me on this. Um, it must be easy to read. So if, as I, I had maybe 10 applicants apply recently to something. And one of the things I do is I do 20 seconds. Can I see everything I need to see on the left-hand side? Is it bolded? Is it underlined? Is it all caps? Is it distinct? Does it make it easy for me to read? So you want to make sure that everything you do um, is extremely organized and easy to read. If it's cluttered, if it's written in paragraph format, um, it becomes more difficult for me as a reader because then I have to read through your paragraphs. And so then I want to throw it out, right? Um, you want to make sure that you're using white space, that you're using bullet points, that your bullet points are consistent. Uh, that's a big key thing for me. If you don't pay attention to detail, I automatically throw your resume out, right? Um, you want to choose a standard font, which is usually Times New Roman, or it's going to be Arial. Um, and you want that font to be about 10 to 12 point size font, not any smaller. Uh, your name obviously is the first thing that they're going to see, but you don't want to make it too large, right? So if you're choosing to use Bailey's example, right, with the larger name, then it should be no more than 18 point font uh, max. So keep that in mind. In terms of layout continued, if you're doing a hard copy resume, which is extremely rare these days, but if you are, uh, most often I recommend if students get an interview to bring a hard copy just in case they can't find it that day, you want that um, you want the paper color to be white, beige, a very light gray or an ivory. Don't do pink or bright green. Um, and you want it to be on 24 pound um, paper. So it's quality, quality resume paper. I am gonna say this over and over and over again, as I get ready to look through your resumes and you turn them in this week into the discussion board, um, you have to proofread everything. Um, I would say have at least three other people read your resume and those three other people should not be in healthcare. 
And I would also say, do not rely on spell check. I can't tell you the number of times I relied on spell check and had a typo. So you want people to proofread. You want people to give you feedback that aren't in healthcare, right? Um, and I think that is what makes really good resumes. Um, you want to watch present and past tense. So example, if you've completed an internship, you use words with ED on them. So developed, uh, treated, right? Versus if you're in a current internship, treating, developing, right? So you always want to adjust. What I tell students is the reality is when you apply to a job, most often it's going to be past tense. So just write your resume in past tense. In a resume, you really don't have room for uh, personal pronouns. So I developed, right? It's just developed. Um, so you want to take first person out. You can use first person, however, in your cover letter, which will be part two of our online lecture. Um, and then again, I've said this multiple times, you need to make sure that you are adjusting your resume to meet the job that you are applying to. So your objective might change, right? For example, you might highlight certain skills more than others in specific jobs that you're applying to. Um, and then you no longer need Need to use the line references furnish upon request essentially what you're going to do is just give them a, a very brief reference page that they can kind of refer to so it's going to end our um, online lecture for for resumes um, I am going to do a, a five minute brief overview on a sample kind of resume that I've laid out which will also be helpful in helping you develop uh, your resume